And so today is going to be the final message in our family discipleship series. And just as a way of review, let me go over kind of where we've been. The first week of our series, Pastor Danny preached on how to leave a godly legacy for God's glory. And all these messages, you can go and you can look back on YouTube and find them if you didn't, uh, were, didn't get a chance to be here in person. But he talked about, he used that word legacy and talked about how it is that we can leave a godly legacy for generations to come. He said, let God be number one, establish a foundation of love, grow a biblical worldview, always teach the word, comply to the word of God, and yield your home to God. And he looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6, a famous passage about you know, having the word of God ever before your children. Uh, and so we looked at that passage and he laid out how it is that we can leave a legacy for generations to come for the glory of God. Then last week we looked at Psalm 127, which is really where the series title got its name, Raising Arrows, because if we have kids within our home, we are not only discipling them, but we are raising warriors for the kingdom, right? And we are shaping arrows that God is going to use to make an impact on the world. And they are, in fact, the greatest legacy you as a parent have. And so I talked about if we are going to properly disciple our children, there are four things, according to that passage, that we must do. The first one is we must surrender them to the Lord. Remember, they are not ours. They are a gift given to us by God, and we need to regularly surrender them to the Lord and recognize that these are not my kids, God. They're yours, and I'm going to do the best I can to raise them for your glory. We need to see them with a proper perspective. Remember, the Bible says they are a heritage of the Lord, not a hassle. They're a blessing, not a burden, even though so many times we often think of the contrary, that they're a hassle or a burden. That is not the way that God sees them, and so we need to have the right perspective in how we look at them. The third thing, according to that passage, we need to shape them according to the word, right? There's all sorts of helpful tips you can get from other people, but what we need to focus on is how do we shape them and mold them according to the word of God. God's word is truth, and we need to help them understand biblical truth so that when they leave our homes, they will not be sidetracked by all that the world has to throw at them, right? They, you know, a lot of times people leave the home and they are just bombarded with all these truths they've never encountered and they don't know enough about God's truth to be able to combat the things that they're hearing and we see them slip away. So we need to shape them according to the word, the same way that each arrow is unique and has different purposes. So each of our children are unique and we need to shape them according to the word of God. And then as we've done all those things, we can then send them out with confidence into the world as they get to that point where they're ready to leave our home and we can just trust that God is going to use them in great and mighty ways. And so that was Psalm 127. And in fact, I'm just going to read that Psalm real quickly because then it's going to flow into where we're going to be here today in Psalm 128 in a message I simply entitled Fundamentals of a Godly Family. So I'm going to read Psalm 127 and then I'm going to jump into Psalm 128 and I invite you to follow along. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who lay, build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And now we jump into Psalm 128. It says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much just for the opportunity we have just to open up God's word before us this morning. Father, we know that the truths we find contained here on the pages of scripture are truths that will transform our lives from the inside out. And so, Father, we pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you will take the truth of your word this morning and plant it into our hearts and help us to be changed and transformed as a result. Father, as I speak today about just the, the family when I know that we have people here from all different realms within the family. Some who have kids that are out of the house. Some who are single, never had kids. Some who are uh, raising kids as a single mom or a single dad or whatever the case may be. And so, Lord, I know that, Father God, we find ourselves in many different 
uh, areas when it comes to the home. But I pray, Lord God, that there will be nuggets of truth that every single person will be able to apply to their lives today and that you'll use your word in a powerful way in each of our lives. Because, Father, as we look around, we see that, Father, the next generation is getting even less spiritual than the generation before. We see young people leaving the church, it seems like, at record rates. And, Father, as much as we try to blame other things like technology or the schools or education or any number of things, Lord, oftentimes the problem is actually within the homes because we are not discipling the next generation in the way that you've called us to. And so, Father, I pray that this will be a challenge to us, that it will encourage us, that it will maybe convict us if that is necessary, and that you will use the truth of your word to speak to us in powerful ways. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the scariest moments of my life occurred a couple days after my oldest daughter, Felicity, was born. You see, here we were, excited about our first child being born, looking forward to all that the future held, when all of a sudden it hit me. Here I am loading this innocent baby into the car, and the realization hits me that Jen and I are now responsible for the well-being of this fragile little baby for years to come. Now, at this point, we've already chosen to stay an extra day at the hospital, right? They gave you the option, hey, do you want to go home or do you want to stay one extra day? And we're like, let's stay another day because it's a little bit easier to take care of this kid in the hospital. But we've already had that one day there, and now it's time to load up our baby girl into the car and drive her away where she will be our responsibility for all these years looking forward. The day has come and gone that we stayed there and we were discharged from the hospital, set off to not just with the expectation that we would keep this child alive, but with the expectation that we would do all that was necessary for this little baby to thrive. And the fact that we were entrusted with such a responsibility was hard enough. But to add to the fact of the challenge, they sent us away from the hospital with no instruction manual whatsoever about what to do with this kid. Can anybody relate to that first child? You get it in the car and you realize there's no instruction manual, there's no how-to like list. You are just sent away with this baby and you are required to do everything necessary to care for that child. Everything else you buy has an instruction manual, right? Any appliance you buy has a manual about do all these things, you know, and if this happens, do this, right? Any car you buy has an instruction manual there in the glove box, the owner's manual lets you know kind of how it all works. But here you are sent with this child and no instructions given whatsoever. I remember it was a scary moment, and you're driving home, it's like, oh goodness, you know, having my wife in the car is one thing, but now you have this little baby, and you're going super slow, trying to make sure, you know, you stop at every yellow light, and, you know, have full stops at the stop sign, like you should anyways, but, um, and all that stuff that maybe you're not as careful about, you're extremely careful on that trip home from the hospital, because again, pretty much everything you buy has an instruction manual, but not the baby they give you to take home from the hospital. It was in that moment we were left with the things we had observed over time and our own common sense as our guide. What a frightening scenario this really was as I think back on that day. But I'm so thankful that even though the hospital didn't give us an instruction manual for how to raise our child, God's word does. And he tells us what is necessary if we want to raise children to love the Lord. His word is sufficient for the task of raising children. And if you have young kids at home, I hope you know and are thankful for that reality. Because there are days that we mess it up. There are days that we screw it up. There are days we pillow our head at night wondering what in the world did I do to this child. But I'm so thankful we have the word of God as an anchor by which we can raise children. Our kid. And so our main idea simply is this today. The Bible is God's instruction manual for life, and it contains all that is needed to raise a godly family. So let me say that again. The Bible is God's instruction manual for life, and it contains all that is needed to raise a godly family. So as we conclude our series on family discipleship, I want to make sure that we all have a clear understanding of the basics of family life. 
Because again, raising children is not easy. And I talked about last week, even if you don't have young kids in your home at this moment, there are things you can do to come alongside those families. And there are things that you can do to help disciple the next generation, to help point them in the right direction. So when they get to the age where they are ready to leave the home, that they have a good foundation to follow the Lord Jesus. Again, raising children is not easy. And as I prepared for this message this week, I have felt extremely inadequate to even stand and preach on this topic. Because again, there are so many times as a current father of young kids that I know that I get it wrong. And I look out here at so many of you who have already raised kids and I feel like, you know what, instead of me being up here, I should be out there and I should let you be up here. Because again, there are so many times that I know I get it wrong. So many times that I know I've messed it up. And so I just, and being vulnerable right now, I have struggled this week with the, even the idea of preaching this message. Because I know this is something I have by no means figured out whatsoever. I shared with you last week that as a youth pastor, I used to have teens come in and parents come in and they're talking about their teen. And in my immature mind at that time as a young 20-something, I'm like, oh, well, just do this and this is what it takes. And then you have kids of your own and you're like, well, I do nothing. <laughs> and so I've struggled this week because I know the challenges that I face and I know how many times I mess up. And I feel that sometimes when I'm standing up here, I should at least have some clue of what I'm telling you. So please understand, as I preach this message to you, if I'm pointing one finger out that direction, I have four fingers pointed at me because I have a long way to go in this area. And there are so many things that I get wrong. But I feel that part of my role also as a pastor is to help us understand what the Word of God says. And so as I help us understand the Word of God, I'm also preaching to myself, helping myself understand what God's word says in this area. So can we lay that as a foundation this morning? Can you understand that when I'm preaching this, I am not preaching it from an area of expertise. I am preaching this as a fellow struggling parent trying to figure all this out in the moment. And desperately clinging to God's word. That what God says is true. And if I will hold fast to these things, then when my kids are grown and ready to leave the home, Hopefully I have done something right to where they've made the decision that they're going to follow Jesus themselves. And so now that we've laid that foundation, I think it's important that we understand what the fundamentals are of a godly family. Because fundamentals are so important. If you're a sports fan, you know that when it comes to sports, fundamentals are so important. The other day, Noah and I were out playing basketball and he loves just to shoot hoops and go out there. And, and so I was sitting there, and he likes to shoot, but then we started kind of working on dribbling, and I began to show him, you know, how to dribble a basketball. And I said, listen, buddy, shooting is one thing, but if you can learn how to dribble, and you can master dribbling, and you can master passing, shooting is not nearly as important if you can master those things well. Because I understand that if he gets the fundamentals of all the other parts of basketball down, shooting will naturally come. But it's those other things that you need to master in order to actually be good at basketball. Because you, if you can shoot lights out but can't dribble or pass or anything else, you're not going to be a good basketball player. Fundamentals are important in every area of your life. Think about the job that you have. If you don't know the basics of what that job entails, the fundamentals, then you are not going to succeed. And so today I want us to simply look at the fundamentals of the family that we can see how God views the family and what it is that we as parents or as grandparents or as single individuals, whatever it is, what we can do to make sure the fundamentals are in place so that we can help raise up the next generation. Because the fundamentals are so important, not just in all these other areas of life, but also when it comes to family life. And so if you're taking notes today, the outline is very simple. We're going to look at a couple different passages. We're going to kind of start and end in Psalm 28, but then we're going to jump over to Ephesians 6 and spend probably a crux of the message there. We're going to get a picture of a godly family, the practices of a godly family, and then we're going to look at the product of a godly family. So let's begin here in Psalm 128 and look at the picture of a godly family. If you notice with me, Psalm 128 
says in the very beginning, if you have this title, it tells us that it is a song of ascents. So if you weren't here last week, I explained a little bit of what that entailed. But a song of ascent was simply a song that they would recite or sing, typically on their journey to Jerusalem. If you know anything about Israeli culture, you know that there are several important feasts that they would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate. So multiple times a year, they would make a journey from wherever they were to Jerusalem. And as they go on this pilgrimage, this journey, they would recite these different songs. And this would have been one of those songs of ascent that they would have recited and sang on the journey. And it's interesting that Psalm 127 and Psalm 128 would be the songs of ascent. Because when you look at it, they are about the family. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, it makes sense because Jewish culture was centered around the family. And so here in Psalm 128, we get this, this song that they would often recite and quote and sing as they travel to and from Jerusalem. And in this psalm, we get the picture of a man who is gathered around his table with children and grandchildren alike. Notice what it says. As we get a picture of a godly family, it says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his way. So we're getting the idea of this man who is fearing the Lord. And that's not this idea of fear where you're terrified of the judgment of God, but it's this idea of being in awe and having this just reverential respect of who God is. Blessed is everyone, man or woman, who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And so let me tell you, this could be the application for the sermon that you need today. Do you want to live a blessed life? Do you want to be, live a life favored by God? It says, blessed is everyone who what? Fears the Lord. Do you have a right fear of the Lord in your life? Are you living with that proper respect of who God is and his character and his person? It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his way. Because one is naturally the byproduct of another. If you fear the Lord, your natural response will be to walk in obedience. Right? So maybe you're sitting there today and saying, I don't have young children at home. I don't know if this applies to me. Well, let me tell you, this verse does. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. We all need to live a life that is fearing the Lord and walking in obedience as a response. And so we have the picture of this man who is pursuing God, who's loving God, who's obeying God. It says, you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. So we see the favor that God is pouring on that kind of person. And then it goes on to say, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And we'll get to those last couple verses at the end, but notice what it says in verse 3 through 5. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. So this psalm gives us a picture of what a godly family looks like. It begins with the father as a spiritual leader setting the tone, being one that fears the Lord. So understand, last week was Mother's Day, right? And we talked about Psalm 127 on Mother's Day. I kind of wish Father's Day was today because this is a great message for fathers. And, but understand, it starts with the man as a spiritual leader in the home who's being one that fears the Lord. And as he's doing that, it says his wife will be like a fruitful vine. She'll be productive. And it says your children will be like olive shoots around your table. And later on it talks about may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So we have this idea of this godly man who is walking with the Lord. And because he's walking with the Lord, the Lord is blessing every area of his life. He's got a wife that loves him and is taking care of everything at home and helping with the kids. And you have all these kids gathered around your table. And it's just this beautiful picture of a godly family. And understand... He uses the picture of a vine, and he uses the picture of olives because those were things that were very common for the people of Israel. They would have been very familiar with the grapevine and very familiar with the olive tree. And so the idea we get here is that this is something that they would have known that was normal. This is a standard that we can all live up to. There's nothing extravagant about those things. It's not something that only the special or the elite could have access to. No, these were common things for all people. 
And so it's almost like the psalmist is letting us know, listen, anybody can do this. And it all starts with this idea of fearing the Lord. And I love the idea that he has that they are gathered around the table. They're gathered around the table. Maybe not just read over that and skip over that phrase without pausing to consider how important it is to gather around the table with your family. So a word of encouragement for those of us who have young kids, because I know life gets busy, I know life gets hectic, and I know sports schedules and school schedules and all these schedules can be insane. Can I encourage you to do all that you can to guard time around the table with your family? My parents are here today, and as I look back, I'm thankful for the many times that in the evening, despite everything else we had going on, there were so many times that we gathered around the table. The food was there, and we were able to eat together and converse together and share with each other what had gone in the, on in the day. And again, life is busy. But one thing we try to do in our home, and even if it's not dinner, we try to at least, if we can, make sure that we have a meal around the table together because it's there when you're sharing a meal together that the kids are able to kind of let their guard down. You're able over food to discuss what's gone on in the day. And that can be a great place for discipling your children as you share a meal together because the table is a place of unity. It's a place of togetherness. It's a place of sharing and we should guard time around the table with our family. I know work schedules can be crazy and all those things, but can I encourage us as, as children of God to be people who guard time around the table, especially if you have young children at home. This can be vital in helping you disciple your children. And again, when I was a kid, I didn't realize how important that time was, but now looking back, I'm thankful that we had time around the table. My dad would come home from work and we would eat dinner together as a family. And I, I cherish now those times. And now that I have kids of my own, it's easy to get so busy with other things that we neglect that or this person's eating a meal then and that person's eating a meal then and we just make sure everybody's fed and we go on with our life. And again, I know there's a time for that and there's certain instances where that has to happen but we need to do the best we can to at least guard some time when we are gathering together around the table. And that's the picture we see here. This godly man who is leading his family and all these generations are gathering around the table together because you had the patriarch who had followed the Lord and feared the Lord and walked in obedience to the Lord. And as a result, everything else in his life was blessed. It's like the umbrella, right? As one man is walking with the Lord and covered. You have so many others who are under that umbrella as well and covered by the blessing of the Lord because the patriarch, the father of the family, has chosen to obey the Lord. So we see the picture of a godly family here. The primary emphasis on this psalm is on the man, on the father. And as we look around our culture, we see there's a fatherless pandemic that is plaguing our nation. Now, can I just let you know, men, that when you fail to usurp your role as a leader within your home, the wives usually do a great job. And I commend, many of you are single moms in here, and I commend you because you do an excellent job in taking on that role as a spiritual leader within your home. But can I remind us as men that although our wives may do a great job taking up that mantle when we lack, God has given the responsibility of leading our home to us as men. And so we need to understand this psalm, although it's crucial to everybody, and we all need to fear the Lord and walk in obedience, the picture here is of a godly man who is leading his home. So God has called us as men to be the leaders within our home, to lead our families well, to be the pace setters within the home when it comes to spiritual things. And so that is a picture we see here of a godly family, a man who is following the Lord, who's fearing the Lord, who's walking in obedience. And as a result of his love for the Lord, everything in his life is kind of collateral, blessed because of his obedience. So we see the picture of a godly family. Now let's look at the practices 
of the godly family and do this i want to go to a famous passage in ephesians ephesians chapter 5 and 6 if you want to turn there in your bibles with me i believe the verses will also be on the screen but you can't really do a family discipleship series i don't think without looking at what paul has to say about the family in the book of ephesians so ephesians chapter 5 we see paul lay out for us under the inspiration of the holy spirit what the role is of the husband and the wife and the child. And, and so we see kind of the, the practice of what a godly family looks like according to God. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the role necessarily of the husband and the wife and those kind of things. But I do want to highlight them briefly. And it says this in Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And so understand, and sometimes we'll read that verse and we'll see that word submit and we'll be like, ugh, and that kind of rubs us the wrong way. But understand, it is not saying that wives are lesser than, it does not say that they are less in value in the eyes of God, it is just saying that, listen, within the home there has to be a leadership structure. And that leadership structure is established as which the husband is to be the spiritual leader, which means he's the one that's responsible before God to lead the home. And then the wife submits to that leadership. So let's pause there and let's get to verse 25 where it says the role of the husband. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the words, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. Now, did you notice that there's a lot more instruction here to the husband than there is to the wife? So I rushed through the wife part because the husbands are probably sitting there thinking, yep, it says that they are to submit. But then I get to the, wife, the husband part, and there's a whole lot more verses on their role. And I think that's usually where the problem lies. Because most of the time, when I look at couples that are following after the Lord, and I see a husband that is chasing after Jesus and a husband that is loving Jesus in a sacrificial way like it says to love here. You usually find that most women have no problem to submitting to that kind of man who's going to lay his life down for his family. who's going to pursue Jesus in that kind of way. The problem is men look at that word and see submit. And fail to read the rest of the chapter where it says their submission comes out of your love for them. And that's where you get issues and conflicts. And whenever I do premarital counseling, this is usually where we spend the beginning part of our time together. Because I try to lay out to them what their roles are within the husband and wife relationship. Because again, that word submit often rubs us the wrong way. But I know this. That in the same way that I'm submit to submit to the Lord because I know he loves me and gave himself for me. That's the same picture of the marriage where a husband loves his wife in such a way he's willing to lay his life down for her. And in that case, she's going to have no problem submitting to his spiritual leadership because she sees that he loves Jesus passionately and would do anything for her and for the family. So again, I'm going to preach a whole message on this. But I'm going to just kind of skip through it and kind of let us know these are the roles within the family. We see the role of the husband. We see the role of the wife. It says then in verse 32, this mystery is profound. and I'm saying that it is first in Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so there he hints that the basic need of a wife is to feel secure a basic need of a man within a marriage is to be respected. And so this is a great study to do. But I wanted to at least read it so we understood what the roles of were for the husband and the wife. So we see the role of a husband and a wife. And now we're going to transition into kind of what the series is talking about. And that is discipling the next generation. Because chapter 6 begins with the role of children within the home. But I didn't want to just jump to chapter 6 without first at least mentioning 
the biblical roles of the family and the husband and the wife that we see in Ephesians 5 because that kind of transitions into what we're going to see in chapter 6. But I think it's significant because one of the best things, mom and dad, that you can do to disciple your children is to have this kind of marriage. If your kids see a marriage that is biblical, that's going to speak volumes to them. Husbands, if you will love your wives in this kind of way, what you're teaching your children by what they see is going to go far, way farther than a lot of things you may try to tell them and teach them with your mouth. Because words speak and actions speak, but actions speak a whole lot louder than words speak. And so one of the greatest things, mom and dad, that you can do to disciple your children is to love each other and to understand the role that God gives you within the context of this home. And so again, understand, I know that in this room, it's not always a situation where you have a husband and wife in this kind of way. And I want to commend all of you moms who have raised kids or who are raising kids alone. But I want you to understand that God is a perfect father who is going to be there to help you as you try to navigate filling both these roles within the home. So we see the husband, we see the wife, and now we get to chapter 6 where we see Paul begin to now talk about the role of children. Verse number 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So he's laid out the role for the wife, the role for the husband. Now he's getting to the role of children within this godly home. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. So the role of children, then, we see is to obey and to honor. That's the role of children. Now, obedience speaks of outward action, while honor speaks of the attitude of the heart. Right? We all have seen children who obey outwardly, but inwardly are not all on the same page as mom and dad, haven't we? Go to your room. All right, I'm going to go to my room, right? That's not an attitude of honor, but it is an action of obedience. But here the Bible says the role of children is to honor and obey their parents. And I feel like as we look at this, it's easy to look at this within the context of young children. I think that is the main uh, focus here. But I think that word honor extends far beyond just life when your kids are in your home. I think that attitude of honor stretches way into life, even once you're an adult and you have parents still around in your life. That attitude of honor, I think, should always be there. Now, there might be times that as you're grown, your parents have advice and tell you certain things that, you know, you decide not to do. And that's okay. You don't have to listen to every single piece of advice that they give you. But you should still have the attitude of honoring your parents, even after you leave the home. And so understand, although obedience will look different into adulthood, this attitude of honor should remain the same, right? Because the cycle of life is a funny thing, isn't it? Parents spend their lives taking care of their children, and their ch children grow, and then eventually children begin to take care of their parents. And you have just this picture of this honoring that takes place from childhood into adulthood as the roles begin to reverse. And so we see here the practice of the godly family, the role of children is to both honor and obey their parents. And it says that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now there is a principle given that you will live a life that is blessed. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because you do this that you're going to live until you're a hundred. This is a general principle here. But it's saying, listen, as you do these things, your life will be blessed. It will go well with you as a whole when you have this attitude towards your parents, when you obey them and honor them. And then it says in verse number four, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Colossians 3.21 is a parallel verse that says this, For fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So we see here that obviously when it comes to raising children, there is a certain way in which we should train our children and discipline our children. Because there's a way the Bible tends to imply that we can do it to where we're causing them to become frustrated and discouraged and angry, or where we're doing it in a proper way. And so this begs the question, how do we provoke our children to anger? And again, I preach this from the place of a desperate parent trying to figure all this out. So please, I want to remind you the place from which I'm coming from. Because you know my kids, many of you. And you know I have not figured this out. You know I'm desperately trying to get a handle on how this all works. And I didn't realize how impatient and how prone to anger I was until I had kids. And now things I never struggled with before, I struggle with. All right? But it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. So how, are, how do we do that? We gotta pause, gotta pause and ask ourselves the question, what would cause our children to be provoked to anger? But I think there may be several things that would go along with this. One could be not taking an active role in discipline, right? Not taking an active role in discipline because children need boundaries. They need to know what they can and cannot do. They need clearly spelled out, you know, these are the boundaries, and if you step over them, these are the consequences. And one of the ways we can provoke them to anger is not giving them those kind of clear Boundaries. I think another way we can provoke them to anger, we can discourage them, is by speaking hurtful words. Right? Speaking words that penetrate the heart. Sometimes without pausing to think, you can allow your mouth to say things that you look back and don't really mean. And those words can do great damage and can provoke them to anger if you are not careful. That's why you have to always be willing to, if that happens, to receive the grace that God offers because he knows you're not going to be a perfect parent, but then also be willing to extend grace to your children and say, buddy, sweetie, I messed up. I should not have said those things. And they need to understand that you're fallible too. And when you say those things, that you're willing to confess them and seek forgiveness because that's living out what a child of God looks like right before them. So speaking hurtful words. Another way we can provoke our children to anger is by showing favoritism. You probably all heard the story of the Bible, how Isaac favored Esau and Rebekah favored Jacob and all the conflict that ensued because of the favoritism by each of those parents. Not the happiest of homes and not the best of results as a result of those, that favoritism that was shown. And so parents, we need to do, make sure we are being adamant about not showing favoritism to our children. Despite the fact that there are some that may be more obedient than others, despite the fact that there might be some that are gifted differently than others and it meshes better with you in those respects, we have to be sure that we are not showing favoritism because that's a way that we can provoke our children to anger or discourage them in the process. Another way that we can provoke our children is by not setting clear expectations. Right? If children are just wandering around aimlessly, not knowing what's expected of them, and then getting in trouble for things they didn't even know there was an expectation about, what kind of blessing are we being in their lives? We're doing a disservice to them by not setting up those clear expectations. Another way could be just being discouraging, not speaking life into your kids. If everything is always negative and everything is always discouraging and there's never any positive, you may be on your way to provoking your children to wrath. Now again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are probably many of other things that we can do, but it is very clear here that as God lays out the role of parents when it comes to their children, it says 
very clearly, do not provoke them to anger. So there's a way in dealing with them and handling that relationship that can lead them to discouragement. And so we have to guard against that. And then he goes on to say, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This speaks of both training and correcting. We need to be intentional about teaching our kids the Bible. And we've talked about this a lot, whether that be a set-apart time and family worship as you get together, or whether that be in just the natural uh, conversations of life where you are bringing the gospel of Jesus and the principles of Scripture into those everyday moments. We need to be intentional about teaching our kids the truths of the Bible. Right? Because there's always going to be things that arise throughout the day that are going to give you opportunities to speak those truths into the lives of your children. But you have to be intentionally thinking about it, right? But it's easy to get so busy that we just go on with life and forget about the deposit spiritually that we're making into the lives of our children. And so we need to understand that we need to be intentional about teaching our kids the Bible. We talked about this some last week, right? It's not going to happen just naturally. We have to be intentional about it. So that's the idea of training, instructing. But then it says, bring them up in the discipline. So we also have to be willing to correct. And discipline is not easy, but it is needed. There need to be consequences for poor choices because... That is life. Don't you face consequences of the choices you make in everyday life? At your job? In the community? As you go about your daily life, there are consequences to every choice that you make. And so we need to train our children as they're young to understand that there are consequences to the choices they make. That is part of bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, methods of discipline may vary from child to child. But regardless of the method, we need to understand that all children need discipline. All children need correction. And so here, the Bible, as you read and study the Bible, you see the Bible gives us several reasons as to why discipline is so important. And this is one of the hardest things to do as a parent. Right? Our kids don't understand when you say, hey, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. They don't understand in the moment. But you, our parents, understand. It is not an easy thing to discipline your children. But yet the Bible says that it is necessary. So let's look at some of these verses. Why is it so important? And what does the Bible say as to why it is needed? Well, Hebrews 12, 6 says this. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So we see that discipline is actually an expression of love. If you love your child in the same way that God loves his children and disciplines them, so you who are parents who love your children must discipline your children because it is an act of love. Clearly spelled out here in the Bible. Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, Folly is gotten up in the heart of a child. But the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Ever been around kids? Seen that folly that's built up in the heart of a child? The foolishness that's just naturally there? And you might laugh, but you were that once. <laughs> right? We all had that foolishness bound up in our heart. That folly that was there. And the Bible says that discipline is important because it drives out the foolishness from within the heart. And so correction and discipline is necessary because a child's natural bent is towards foolishness. I told you guys this many, many times. I do not have to train my kids to do the wrong thing because they are naturally bent towards foolishness. I have to train them to do right. And it says discipline helps drive that foolishness out of the heart of a child. Proverbs 23. Proverbs speaks a lot about this idea of discipline. Do not withhold discipline from a child 
If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, he will save his soul from Sheol. So another reason for our discipline is that it rescues them from judgment. It is a huge help to your child. Because all to be left to their own devices, the end result would not be good. And so it says you spare the soul of your child. You rescue them from judgment by correcting and by disciplining. Proverbs 29, 15, a rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. So another reason for discipline is that it gives wisdom to the child. Right? It helps a child learn to walk in wisdom. Proverbs 29, 17, a couple verses later, says this, discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give the light to your heart. Ultimately, by you disciplining and correcting your child, the Bible makes it clear that it will bring joy and rest to you as parents. Now, in the moment, it won't be easy. And in a moment, it'll be a fight, and it'll be a struggle, it'll be a challenge, and there'll be a lot that goes into it. But the Bible says here, it will bring peace, or rest and joy to the parents who consistently discipline and correct their child. Then we get back to Hebrews 12, verse number 10 through 11. It says, For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best for them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So why else is discipline needed? Because it builds character and ultimately has far-reaching effects in the lives of your children. So again, young parents, again, I'm not talking about your age. I'm talking about those of you who have young kids at home, right? I don't want to offend anybody. You know, I say, I caught some young and some old. Just because your parents are grown now the house doesn't mean you're old. I'm talking about those who have young kids at home and are still really in this stage where you're constantly having to correct your children, one of the hardest things to do is to consistently discipline your children. But understand the Bible lays out very profoundly, very clearly why discipline and why correction are important. And as hard as it is in the moment, as tough as it can be in those specific instances, you are planting seeds that will one day grow and will one day produce fruit, even though it's hard and painful and challenging in the moment. And so we see here, the Bible gives us the role of the husband, the role of the wife, the role of the children. And as he talks to fathers specifically, but really parents in general, he says, hey, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so there we see the practices of a godly family. We started with a picture of a godly family, right? This family where they are pursuing Jesus, where the generations are gathered around the table, reaping the blessings of a father or mother who sought after the Lord and feared the Lord. Then we see the practices of this godly family where the husband is lovingly and loving and sacrificing for his wife and she is submitting to the leadership in the home and children who are obeying and honoring their parents. Which then brings us to the product of a godly family. And I want you to turn back to Psalm 128, if you would, as we close out the message with this, the product of a godly family. So we saw the picture of a godly family in the beginning of Psalm 128. We saw the practices of a godly family and what each role was there in Ephesians 6. And now we're coming back to Psalm 128 to end. It says in verse 5, the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And here Psalm 128 gives us the results of what happens when fathers rise up to the challenge and truly fear the Lord and take that spiritual leadership within 
their home. Not only will the wife and family be blessed, but it says that he will have an impact on culture as a home. Notice it starts out with the individual. In verse 1, blessed is everyone, the individual that fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Then it goes to the family. Right? Your wife will be blessed. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Then it goes to the community. Right? The religious community. The Lord may bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. So then we see the blessing it is to the faith community, Zion, and then also to Jerusalem as a whole. As you look around, it's clear, isn't it, that the world is a mess? Families are falling apart. Men are not rising up to lead in the way the Bible calls them to lead. And then because they are not rising up, we see collateral damage in the family. Right? And the victims really in men not leading are the kids. And so often we forget about just how damaging this is in the lives of children. And that's why we need to be focused on discipling the next generation. But I love how this psalm spells it out and how it transitions from individual to family to faith community to city as a whole. Right? Do you want to make an impact on the culture in which we live? Do you want to put a dent in the ground that Satan is taking? Do you want to have an impact and be a light and a testimony to a world around us that is far from Jesus? Well, learn to live and structure your family in this kind of way, and that will speak volumes to a world that has no idea what family values are all about anymore. They have no idea what gender is all about, much less the family. And so we need believers to rise up and to say, this is what God has called me to do. As a mom, as a dad, as a grandparent, as just a single part of a church community, this is how we train up the next generation. This is how we disciple young people to follow after Jesus. And we all understand what our role is in that. And we all stay focused on doing what we can to ensure that when the kids in this church and the kids in our lives grow to a point where they're ready to leave the house, they do not become another statistic, but yet they go out and they are launched like arrows into a world where they make a major impact for the kingdom of Christ. But it does not happen by accident. It takes intentionality. It takes focus, it takes persistence, it takes determination, and it takes men and women who start by saying, I am going to fear God and walk in his ways. And as I do that, the overflow is going to extend to the next generation. And I'm going to do all I can to bless them and encourage them and come alongside of them and alongside families that are raising kids and say, we can do this. Because God's give us all that we need, the instruction manual, not only for life, but how we can train up the next generation, that we stay focused on what God says, that he promises that he will bless our kids. And like arrows, they will go out and make a difference in the world in which we live. So that is what God calls us to do. As moms, as dads, as grandparents, as a church family, it's our job, our responsibility to come along the next, side, the next generation and do whatever we can to point them to Jesus. So even if you don't have young kids at home, we all have a role to play. We've heard it said it takes a village, right, to raise a family. And I know personally I'm thankful for this village that God has given me as I attempt to raise my family. But we're not in this alone. We're in this together. And may Living Stones be a place where we see the next generation raised up and shot out like arrows, where they make a major dent for the cause of Christ in the wicked and evil world in which we live.